WJBC. Even non-Christians know the story of the Nativity, when the Holy Spirit visited Mary and Jesus was to become both man and God on earth. This story presents a major turn for world religion. For years after the death of Jesus, many within the growing religion weren't even sure how to reckon with the figure who was both man and God. Bart Ehrman is an American New Testament scholar and a distinguished professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In his new book, How Jesus Became God, Ehrman examines the historical record of the beginnings of Christianity and attempts to answer the question of how did a rogue Jewish apocalyptic creature become seen as the Son of God and one with God the Father. And we welcome Bart Ehrman to the show. Bart, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. So to frame your book, How Jesus Became God, tell us a little bit about how your scholarship examines the historical record of Jesus' times and the early beginnings of Christianity. I mean, obviously the books of the New Testament are the sources we have, the sources of information we have about what the earliest Christians believed about Jesus. But the books of the New Testament are obviously written by believers and for believers, and they presuppose Christian belief. And what I'm interested in is not what theologians would say about whether Jesus is God or not. I'm interested in the question of how historically this belief came about. Uh, what I try and show in the book is that Jesus himself did not go around saying that he was God on earth, but his later followers did say that. And so the question is, how do you get from point A to point B? How do you get from Jesus' ministry to the idea that he's the second member of the Trinity? So then you say Jesus' followers at the time, the disciples, they, in your view, didn't view him as God. Not during his lifetime, definitely. Because so, so the deal is this. Jesus does call himself divine in the Gospel of John, that fourth and final Gospel, which was written about 65 or 70 years after Jesus' death. But the earlier Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do not have these claims about himself. So that in, in John's Gospel, for example, Jesus says things like, Before Abraham was, I am, uh, where he's claiming the name of God for himself. The name I am is given by God to Moses in the book of Exodus. And the, the Jews know exactly what he's saying. They take up stones to stone him to death. Later he says, I and the Father are one. And again, they break out the stones to stone him. Later he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So these are very exalted claims he makes about himself, but these claims are found only in the Gospel of John. So what I argue in the book is that if Jesus, the historical Jesus, the man himself, was really going around saying these things about himself, why, why wouldn't you find any record of that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, our earlier Gospels? It, it, this would be the most important thing to say about Jesus, and it, surely they didn't just decide to leave that part out. And so I think that's because the Gospel of John is giving a theological understanding of Jesus rather than the understanding of the historical Jesus himself. So in those other books of the Bible, wherein Jesus doesn't say that he is one with God or that he is the Son of God, he does make claims to be the Messiah in some other places in the Bible. What did the term Messiah mean in Jesus' time? This is a key point, because a lot of Christians today think that a lot of Christians have false understandings of what Jews meant by the term Messiah. So a lot of Christians today think that the Messiah was supposed to be God. And that's absolutely wrong. Uh, there were no Jews who thought that the Messiah was God in the sense that, you know, God Almighty. And many Christians think that the Messiah was supposed to be someone who died for sins and was raised from the dead. Well, there weren't any Jews before Jesus came along who thought that's what the Messiah was supposed to be. The word Messiah comes from a Hebrew word, Mashiach, which means the anointed one. It was the term used for the kings of Israel, so that the ancient kings, like King David and King Solomon, when they became king during their coronation ceremony, as part of the ceremony they had scented oil poured on their heads. This was a showing of divine favor, and so they were anointed, and so Mashiach, the anointed one. So the, the kings were called messiahs, but uh, eventually there came a point where there was no more king of Israel, and Jewish thinkers began to think there's going to be a future king, someone who will be like David or like Solomon, someone yet to come, and they called that future king the messiah. 
And so if somebody called Jesus the Messiah, that's what they meant about him, that he was the future king of Israel. It didn't mean that he was God, and it didn't mean that he was going to die for the sins of the world. It meant he was the future king. We're talking with Mark Herman. His new book is called How Jesus Became God. So when did Jesus' followers start referring to him as God? Did it first appear in the Gospels that would later become the book of John? This is something I actually changed my mind about when doing my research. I, I worked on this book for about eight years, and partway through it, I came to realize that what I had previously thought about this question was completely wrong. <laughs> and what I came to realize is that, in fact, even though the followers of Jesus did not call him God during his lifetime, as soon as they came to believe that he was raised from the dead, that's the point at which they came to realize that he, he was divine. It's a little bit complicated. So the disciples were, like Jesus, apocalyptic Jews. They believed that God had revealed the secrets of heaven that make sense of what's going on here on earth. And one of these secrets was that at the end of time, there was going to be a resurrection of dead bodies. People were going to be raised from the dead and enter into eternal life. And so that's what the disciples thought was, was going to happen at the end of time. And then some of them came to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. So since they knew that the resurrection was a bodily resurrection, that that's what the future resurrection is supposed to be, they thought if Jesus is alive, he must have been, become alive in the body. Well, if he's alive in his body, where is he? He wasn't around, and so they came to think right away that God had taken them up to heaven. And so Jesus, in body, was taken to heaven. In the ancient world, one of the things I try to show in my book is that ancient people, whether they were Greeks or Romans or Jews, they thought that if a person was taken up by God to heaven, that made the person a god. And so this is what the disciples came to think right away. When they came to think Jesus was raised from the dead, they came to think that in some sense, he was a divine being. Well, this is the divine part of the Easter story. You present this as the turning point at which Jesus' followers came to believe that he was indeed divine in God. But you also say that many of the accounts of the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection just don't seem to reflect the process of crucifixion and what probably happened to Jesus' body. So talk a little bit about this and about what crucifixion was like at this time, what we know about it from the historical record and from maybe archaeological findings. Right, this was another interesting thing that I discovered while doing my research. Uh, in the Gospels, of course, what happens is Jesus is crucified and then a Jewish leader named Joseph of Arimathea requests his body from Pontius Pilate. Uh, he's dead already, and so Pilate gives Joseph the body. And Joseph of Arimathea buries him in the tomb. And then on the third day, the women go to the tomb and discover that it's empty because Jesus has been raised from the dead. For, for years and years and years, I, I always accepted that that was a historical event, that Joseph really did bury Jesus and the tomb really was empty. Even when I was an agnostic, I said that that probably is historical, and then I had to come up with some other explanations for why the tomb was empty. But in doing my research for this book, it occurred to me to look at what we know about crucifixion in Roman times. It's interesting that there is no literary description of how a person was crucified. There's no description of it in any surviving source. But there are references to people who were crucified. And in virtually all these references, what it says is that the person was typically left on the cross so that their body would decompose on the cross and be eaten by scavengers. So that the bodies were left on the cross for, for days as part of the punishment. So the punishment of crucifixion wasn't only the torture of a very slow and painful death, it was also, uh, part of the punishment was the ravages wreaked on the body after death. Uh, people were not given decent burials. And it was also yeah. an example as well to high profile enemies of the state would be then crucified and on display to show enforce a brutal power. Yeah, it was a, a very serious disincentive for crime. I mean, so they would crucify political insurgents, but they would also crucify lowly criminals. They had a very different view of things from our view today. Today, if somebody's condemned to death, you know, we make it as private as possible and away from the public eye. In the ancient world, uh, in, in the Roman world, if you wanted to, to execute a criminal, 
he did it in public so everybody could see it and they would see the pain that the person goes through then they would see the ravages on the body afterwards and this was a very effective disincentive for people committing crimes so my question in the book was if this is the normal Roman practice to leave bodies on the cross, is there a reason for thinking that an exception would have been made in the case of Jesus? And I argue that given what we know about the governor of Pontius Pilate, there in fact is very little reason to think that he would have made an exception in this case, so that more likely Jesus was left to decompose on the cross and was probably then tossed into some kind of common grave. When you recount the resurrection stories, you say that did make an impact on the belief of Jesus' followers that he indeed was risen and ascended into heaven. Where did that come from? If there was no tomb, as you say, then how was there no tomb to be empty? Yes, so what I point out in the book is that in the New Testament, whenever somebody finds the empty tomb in any of the Gospels, it doesn't make them believe. What makes them believe is when they have a vision of Jesus. Jesus appears to them. And the Apostle Paul, for example, who's writing before the Gospels, never mentions an empty tomb, but he does talk about Jesus appearing to people, including to himself. So what I argue in the book is that the reason people came to believe in Jesus' resurrection is because they had visions of him after his death. And I leave open the question of whether Jesus really appeared to them or whether they were seeing hallucinations. But I talk about both possibilities, and it turns out there's a lot of scholarly investigation into hallucinations. They're very common. They happen most commonly with deceased loved ones. You know, it's like when you see your, your grandmother in your bedroom two weeks after she's dead. Or the other common form of vision is of a religious figure. So the Blessed Virgin Mary, for example, shows up all the time in well-documented instances with lots of eyewitnesses, sometimes to hundreds of thousands of people at once. And so Jesus was both a deceased loved one and a revered religious figure. And so what I argue in the book is that whether you're a Christian or not, you can agree that the followers of Jesus, some of them at least, had visions of him afterwards. Christians would say that's because Jesus really was raised and he appeared to these people, and non-Christians would say that they were having hallucinations. So regardless if they were just hallucinations or they were genuine visions, how did Jesus' followers, first-hand witnesses, the disciples, but also those who came after, come to think of him not as just a divinely inspired prophet or a figure like Mary, who was not God, Mary is not God, even though she might be uh, divinely touched, how did they come to think of Jesus as part of the Trinity, as part of God incarnate? Right, so it's the basic logic that has to do with what ancient people thought about how a human being could also be a divine being. Today, Jesus is the only miracle-working Son of God that people know about or think about. But in the ancient world, there were a number of people who were thought to be both human and divine. Sometimes this is because a human being who was spectacularly beautiful or unbelievably smart or uncannily powerful was taken up to heaven as a reward for his or her virtue and was made a divine being. A human being would be exalted and would be made a god. That happened, for example, with the founder of Rome, Romulus. He was made a god that the Romans then worshipped. Sometimes a person was a divine human because their father was God and their mother was a mortal. So Jupiter would come down and have sex with a woman and the offspring would be a divine man, such as Hercules, whose father was Jupiter and his mother was immortal. The third way that a person could be both divine and human was if a god would come down to Earth temporarily in human form. So there'd be a, sort of temporarily be a human and divine at the same time. What I argue in my book is that the early Christians attributed all three ways to Jesus. A book like the Gospel of Mark understands that Jesus was adopted by God to be his son. So he was a human who was exalted to become divine. The Gospel of Luke understands that the reason Jesus is the Son of God is because his mother was a virgin, and the Spirit of God is the one who made her pregnant. So he's literally the Son of God. The Gospel of John understands that Jesus was a pre-existent divine being who temporarily became human. So all these books agree that Jesus is God, but they understand what that means in a different sense.
You mentioned that the Romans had specific ideas of people becoming godlike, and that was the case with Caesars sometimes. There would be living yes. historical figures, leaders, that would be considered to be divine. When yes. Christianity was trying to gain a foothold in opposition to the political organization of the Roman Empire, was that part of an influence saying that, well, yes, you have your god that is Caesar, or one of your gods that is Caesar, but yet we have our own man who also is a god. Yeah, yeah, this was another thing that I came to realize in doing the research for my book, is that precisely at the time period that Romans were calling their emperors god, is when Christians started calling Jesus god. And I realized that the Christian declaration that Christ is God was not done in a vacuum, that in fact it was done within a very important context because what the Christians were doing were setting up an alternative to the emperor, so that in fact it was a competition uh, in the Christian's mind between this pagan God, the emperor, and the true God, Christ. Bart Ehrman's book is called How Jesus Became God, the Exaltation of a Jewish Preacher from Galilee. He is a New Testament scholar and a distinguished professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he's been talking with us this hour. Bart Ehrman, thanks so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. We're going to take a break. We'll be back after this. It's the Steve Fast Show on WG.